And when I went to touch my left nostril and coat the scab, it just snapped free from my face and was just dangling there by a tiny little piece of flesh that was still connected. This is Med Spa Mayhem, the podcast all about the chaotic world of medical aesthetics. From Botox to lasers to IV bars, learn how to tell real versus fake, legal versus illegal, and safe versus potentially deadly. Hear the crazy stories inside the Med Spa world and find out what questions to ask and how to spot the people cutting corners. I'm your host, Dr. Kate D. Together, we explore the wild west of medicine that is the aesthetics industry. If you're listening to this and have not yet purchased the book, Med Spa Mayhem, please consider doing that now. If we spread the word, not only will we be making these procedures safer for all, but we might just capture the attention of a politician or a reporter or who knows, maybe a documentary filmmaker. Med Spa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. You can find links in the show notes. Today, Krista Carson shares her horror story after filler injections. If you've had dermal fillers, or if you've wondered about why everyone's getting them, you might find her story riveting and terrifying. Knowing about this rare but disastrous filler complication is critical to the decision about whom you'll trust to inject your face. Hi, this is Dr. Kate D, and I'm back today with a very special guest, Krista Carson, who is a singer and stage performer and Instagram model. And she had a very bad experience with dermal filler, leading to quite a disfigurement. And she really wanted to share her story. And uh, I have her here today to do that. Thank you so much for being here, Krista. Thanks for having me. So can you tell the listeners what you do for a living and who you are? Well, I'm Krista, also known as Disfigured Beauty, now online, and I'm a singer, model, stage performer, I'm still working in a limited capacity with all my new impairments. Um, and uh, studying some new things, hopefully. Um, that I can make into a career change in a few more years um, so I can spend less time in front of the camera and on stage. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what happened to you. I know this is a really pretty traumatic thing. Can you tell everybody when you first met the doctor who did this injection and how did you choose his clinic? Uh, it was in 2015, and he uh, is an ENT, a doctor of the ear, nose, and throat, so I figured he would be very well educated in practices of the face. <laughs> had a, He had a, a clinic right in my neighborhood within walking distance called Lumina that was uh, specifically for plastics and cosmetic procedures. So I thought that was a great combination and would be perfect for getting filler. Yeah. And so I know that you went him to him for a number of years and then the disaster happened, obviously, the last time you went there. Can you tell tell us exactly what happened on that last time you had an injection? Sure. Well, it was in 2020, October of 2020. So I had been getting uh, filler for about five years and absolutely loved it. I never had any uh, adverse reactions or allergic reactions or any bad experiences with it at all. So I loved it. I've been doing uh, Botox for about 20 years. So I was seeing him for both Botox and filler. And I went in for a routine injection. I had a wedding I was performing at uh, in Arizona, and we were going to take a little road trip to Arizona and then perform for the wedding. And I wanted to look beautiful for all the pictures and video. So I went in to get my Botox and filler done, had a routine appointment, just like uh, all the other 
times I had gone many times over the years. And by the time I got home about 10 minutes uh, later, because I'm right down the street, uh, I felt where the ice should normally be uh, wearing off and I should feel (laughs) my face again, I was feeling completely numb and tingly across the left side of it. Uh, Not painful, not burning yet, anything like that. So um, it seemed mild and I wasn't sure what it was. I had never experienced it before. So I called the office, but they were already gone for the day. So then started Googling it and couldn't find anything. I read something about linocaine uh, being in some fillers. Yeah, um, lid- about- lidocaine is an anesthetic that's in most fillers. Yeah. It probably was in the filler that you had. And just to clarify, you had your nasolabial folds injected. Is that right? Yes, nasolabial folds, also known as the smile and frown line. My cheek, yeah. and uh, you know, right below my lips, I had those marionette lines that were getting kind of hard, yeah. and um, that's what I wanted to so, fill up. So they were closed for the day that day. So did you call them the next day? What What was the next day like? Well, yes, I couldn't find anything on Google that uh, that seemed particularly threatening or scary. Uh, and the ERs and hospitals were filled with people dying from COVID uh, and were overcrowded at the time. So I thought, you know, I don't want to go to the ER with my little face tingle. And I felt like if I didn't know what it was, they're not going to know at the, at the ER. So um, I just thought I should, you know, stay calm and wait it out um, and call the next day. So I called first thing in the morning. Uh, the swelling and the numbness and tingling was getting a lot worse. And I called and they said, come in right away. So I, you know, zipped down the street back into the office and uh, he came in and examined me and then left the room and came back a few minutes later and said we had hit a blood vessel. So I, I had no idea what that meant. Uh, asked him, you know, what what does that mean? And he said, we don't really know. Uh, we just had to wait and see how it turned out. So that so was- he knew he had hit a blood vessel. And so what did he do about that? At that moment, I he said he, he was going to make some calls, do some research and, you know, let me know how to proceed. Um, and it was starting to uh, to burn and get very swollen. I was starting to slur my speech and not be able to use the left side of my face. Uh, so I asked him if I should just put a bag of peas on it or, you know, I felt like ice would be too hard to put on a very tender, swollen face. So he gave me a bag of those disposable ice packs to take home and said to return the next day. So Okay, so just to clarify here, he recognized that he hit a vessel, that you had a vascular occlusion, but then he gave you ice packs to treat that and didn't treat it in any other way that day? Um, Not at that moment, but after I had gone home and been gone from the office, I'm not even sure how long, maybe 45 minutes or an hour, he called and said I needed to come back. Uh, okay. immediately. And I tried to talk him out of that because I was so tired and, you know, in so much pain. But he said, no, you need to come back right now. And I was like, whoa, okay, that sounds serious. So uh, when you so, went back there, how did he treat it at that time? I remember injections and some kind of ointment or paste that he put on. He was, uh, I believe, injecting me and then uh, just leaving for I don't know how long I, I was sleeping in between, so maybe an hour, and then he would come in with more uh, injections or however he was treating it, uh, and then leave again. So I was at the office that day for many hours, just kind of resting and sleeping in between whatever treatments he was giving yeah. me. And I don't. And remember that is really for an occlusion. So the ice packs are weird because although you had swelling, that's the opposite of what you might want to do for an occlusion because you want to open up blood vessels, not make them shrink. So cold will make a blood vessel shrink down and heat will actually, you know, tend to make it more dilated. So you would think he would have given you heat rather than cold. Um, 
The injections were probably Hyalinex. Uh, that's what generally people use. And then the paste could have been nitro paste, although that's out of favor now. I can't remember how long ago that fell out of favor for treating occlusions, but it's possible to use that. That wouldn't be so unusual. So you went home he, after all of that treatment. Me, um, yeah. At the end of that day, uh, he he talked about warm compresses. So mm -hmm. I okay. said, okay, so no more <laughs> ice. Then. And he said, no, 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 we're going to switch it up and just do the warm compresses. Gotcha. So now. <laughs> so now at least he's... He's done some appropriate treatment. He's giving you warm compresses. Was the skin mottled or white at all when you were yes, there? It was a very odd color. And uh, and that uh, second day uh, when I went back after the ice, it had blown up to about three times the size it was before. And I no longer could speak or eat uh, at all. So that's... Um, uh, so it, it um, started getting better after the, um, after the warm compresses, after I started with that. So it started off kind of bluish, whitish green, very strange color. Then after the ice got really, really swollen and the color was even weirder. Then, mm. uh, the next day after the warm compresses started to settle down. Um, and that's when I, I believe it began turning black. I think it took three days before it had all turned black and then began to blister really severely. Yeah. So do you want to describe to our listeners what happened? to your face after that? Um, the whole left side of my face from underneath my uh, left eye to uh, just above my left jaw turned black and started blistering. Mm -hmm. uh, like never seen anything like it. It was kind of like the equivalent of, I don't know, hundreds of cold sores uh, erupting in my skin. And that was also happening inside my face. So my entire, like, inside of my left cheek and uh, my lips, the left side of my mouth um, and my gums, like, inside everything was erupted in blisters and just painful and burning and bloody and black. And, uh, and the left side of your nose as well. Yeah, my uh, the the heart of it, I believe, was my left nostril. That's where uh, I think the center of uh, the injury was, and around the left side of my mouth. Um, so those two areas were the worst, and then it kind of branched out from there and blistered uh, all around the area. Um, you can see the pictures if you go to my um, uh, my TikTok or uh, YouTube or Instagram and actually see the different phases of the occlusion and what it looked like uh, every few days. And for our listeners, um, we will have links to all those sites in the show notes uh, and also to uh, a, a news article out of the UK that actually has very pretty graphic pictures about what happened. Um, so just a warning, if you're very interested in seeing what a pretty severe vascular occlusion looks like, uh, go to one of those links and, and take a look. So basically the whole left side of your nose um, down to below the corner of your mouth was not just scarred, but ultimately what happened to your nose uh, well, it was uh, it was just black and uh, blistered and pussy. Uh, there were just a lot of uh, blisters and pus and uh, kind of bloody. And uh, it was also a problem because you know it was COVID, so I had to wear a mask. Uh, in and out of the doctor's office and every time I, I left the house and it was so open and gruesome and uh, full of fluid uh, that my mask was fusing uh, um, uh, onto my yeah. face and then opening the, uh, you know, the scabs the up, yeah. every time I took it off. So it was a gruesome mess, but it was unlike any um, injury of any kind that I'd ever seen or felt. So it's, it's kind of hard to describe. And so the result was, um, a portion of your, the left side of your nose basically 
was destroyed and came off. Is that yeah. right? Yes, that took about two weeks. It was Halloween, uh, October 31st. This happened on the 12th was the actual um, blood vessel blockage. And then by October 31st, I had been, uh, you know, going in to see him every couple of days for him to check the wound and take pictures of it. I was trying to avoid the mirror, you know, altogether and just, you know, looking at it as much as possible. So he was caring for the wound. And then um, I was, uh, you know, on my own over the weekend and was supposed to go back on uh, Tuesday because he took Mondays off. Uh, and on that Saturday on Halloween, um, I went to put some of the, you know, healing ointment on it that he had given me. And when I went to touch my left nostril and coat the scab, it just snapped free from my face and was just dangling there by a tiny little piece of flesh that was still connected. And, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I panicked and that must've been frightening. It was so terrifying. I, 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 it was surreal. I mean, I'm like, is this, is this happening? It was like a scene out of a movie or a, a nightmare. I just couldn't believe or wrap my head around what was happening. And I texted him some pictures and I, I said, you know, my, my nostril is falling off. And he said, yeah, the scab is probably going to, you know, come off over the weekend. It's okay. I'll just take a look at it on, um, on Tuesday. And uh, so at that point, I knew he didn't understand what I was saying. And I took a video of me actually lifting the scab up and then, you know, just dropping it. And you see it drop back into oh place uh, on my face. And I sent him that. And I said, no, my nostril is off. <laughs> it is not attached to my face. And he said, uh, my wife and I are going to meet you at my office uh, in an hour. Um, so I, I went, uh, an hour later and met, uh, him and his wife, who's a dermatologist at the office. And, um, at that point he clipped the remaining portion of what had been my nostril. Basically the scab had gotten so hardened that it just took my nostril with it. And the entire nostril was a scab that broke off. Wow. So, um, it was hurting, you know, pinching at the little point of flesh where it was still attached. So he clipped that off and then wrapped my face in, uh, bandages, um, and told me he was going to keep it wrapped for me and that he would dress the wounds and that he was going to be able to fix it. Uh, and I wouldn't have to see myself like that, that uh, I could just keep it wrapped and he would continue to, uh, you know, to, to dress my wounds and do whatever cleaning and upkeep I needed uh, until the wounds were closed and uh, just keep me covered until uh, he could do surgery a few weeks later and replace my <laughs> my nostril. And so at I, the time, he thought he could fix it surgically. Yes, he did. Yeah, and and his wife confirmed that she said I would just I would need to do uh, a skin graft, you know, remove some of the back of my ear and uh, use that to replace the nostril. And then I would need a little zhuzhing. She said, <laughs> I, I've never heard anybody say that before, but she said I would need a little <clears throat> zhuzhing after that, but should be able to go back to work and have everything fine by sometime in January of 2021. So in about three months, uh, they thought they would be able to fix everything. And then she said she could do, I would have some bumpy uh, scarring and that she could fix that with lasers. And so that ultimately that did not happen. So I know that you went to see a plastic reconstructive surgeon after that for a, a second opinion. And what did that surgeon say? He was the one who explained to me, first of all, he took my bandages off and uh, threw them in the trash and handed me a mirror. And he said, you can't keep 
just covering this up. You you need to deal with what's going on here. And he wanted to show me, um, you know, just the anatomy and the different kinds of flesh uh, and, you know, the extensive scar tissue that uh, was going to make it impossible to just do, uh, you know, a little simple zhuzhing, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and explained that um, a forehead <laughs> flap procedure would be my only option where they cut up into your forehead, flip it over, sew it back to your face, try to get blood flow uh, going again. And then it has to stay there for, I guess, three weeks to a month while it heals. And then they dissect it, sew your forehead back together, and then begin a series of zhuzhing (laughs) surgeries to reshape uh, the nostril and uh, start building it back up, which he said I, I had about a 50-50 chance of it drying up and falling off because my scar is so thick and there's such a lack of blood flow through the whole left uh, side of my face now that he wasn't very sure uh, we would actually be able to recreate that nostril, but he wanted to try. Uh, said I would have to wait about a year um, for the flesh to heal before we could attempt a surgery at that point. And um, that's when I just lost, you know, all hope and my desire to live. (laughs) I'm like, how am I going to go a year with half of a nose and, you know, do my job and do my work? It was uh, really shocking. And when I took it back to the ENT, uh, um, and told him that was my only option for surgery. He seemed very surprised. Um, he thought for sure I could just, uh, you know, uh, d- do use por- portions of my ear, cheek, and the bridge of my nose to recreate the nostril. Um, so he was surprised, was surprised that a reconstructive surgeon disagreed with him in the ability to fix um, this. That uh, that his ideas for fixing the the problem were not going to work. I think yeah. he was just surprised to hear that, and he didn't seem to know right. about the forehead flap. He had never mentioned that to me. He showed me other nose jobs that he did where he fixed uh, similar injuries, but not an mm. actual occlusion. So up till this point, several years later... Um, you've been using prosthetics to kind of cover up the the yes when i when I got home and explained to my husband what was gonna happen um you know and then uh, you know asked him like are you sure you wanna <laughs> wanna do this you know our our fun amazing life of just making music and love is over <laughs> you know i've got <laughs> serious, uh, you know, medical problems now, and, and I'm going to have problems for the rest of my life. Um, I don't know what we can do to fix this, and um, I might just want to disappear and not deal with any of this, and it might be easier for you, too. Uh, but he was not down with that and um, <laughs> got very upset with me. And the next morning when I woke up, he had found uh, medical art prosthetics and Greg Guion, um, the man who saved my life and, you know, brought me back hope and showed me amazing videos of the most incredible lifelike prosthetics that are Mm. also functional. And, you know, he could create a breathing tube, uh, an outer nostril, um, just amazing things for me. And when I saw a man go from Skeletor to totally normal, you know, a handsome man with a nose that looked (laughs) absolutely real and incredible and had, uh, you know, nasal passages, breathing tubes, uh, stents attached to it. Um, it changed my whole outlook and I knew that I could survive this if I could just see him and get some prosthetics. And he was able to create, um, a, a nostril and a nasal passage for me that, um, gets the job done. And And I I have to say, um, you do look fantastic. I don't think that if I saw you, you know, randomly somewhere that I would have any idea that you had been through this. So thank you. Thank you. Prosthetic guy is definitely an artist. 
Yeah. Um, Thank you, Greg is, Dion. <laughs> is he he's local in the Northwest somewhere? Uh, no, he is in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So ah, okay. uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> uh, you know, there is a, a woman in Tacoma who does prosthetics, but she doesn't have all the capabilities of um, being able to do things inside the face. And mm-hmm. she works on a lot more uh, hands than noses. So uh, Greg is definitely the one to go to. And since I have to fly out of town um, to see him and get work done, I don't have the option of just going somewhere local to get, um, a, you know, replacement or zhuzhing done on it or, <laughs> you know, yeah. or to get a retouch or a retint or things like that. So unfortunately, right. I have to go to Madison every time I need work on them, but I'm, I'm grateful that he's there. So, So, um, so let's, let's talk about the filler that was used. So, um, you told me that the filler he used was radius and you'd actually had radius in the, in the distant past, um, without any issues, but that this time there was obviously this giant occlusion. So I'd like to just tell our audience a little bit about radius and what occlusion is and why this is such a awful thing. So first of all, Radius is an older filler, and it is made out of um, something called calcium hydroxyapatite. But basically, it's it's calcium. It's a very very firm filler. Uh, you know, calcium is what your bones are made out of. And the thing, the specific thing, is that it is not a dissolvable filler. So there are two fillers used in the United States that are not dissolvable. Radius is one of them, and then Bellafill is the other one. Bellafil is actually, in my opinion, even worse than Radius um, because it's basically plastic beads. It's It used to be called Artifil and people didn't like that because that sounded too artificial. So it became Bellafil. Um, but most doctors will never use Bellafil and not very many use Radius either as a regular filler. Um, some people will use it in a, that's very, very, very diluted. It's called hyperdilute Radius. And that's a whole different story that sort of using this substance as a biostimulator to generate collagen. But in this case, he just used it as though it were similar to Juvederm or Restylane or any of the other fillers that are made out of hyaluronic acid. And those are the kinds that most of us use. So most most people who understand <laughs> the consequences of a vascular occlusion would never use a non-dissolvable filler. So HA fillers are dissolvable with this enzyme that we keep in the fridge called hyaluronidase. And, and actually, even radius uh, is treated with hyaluronidase if there's an occlusion because hyaluronidase does a whole bunch of things that are um, really helpful for an occlusion, even though it doesn't dissolve the radius. So it actually dilates blood vessels. It um, decreases the platelets getting stuck together and forming a clot. It actually decreases that. So it stops clotting. It decreases inflammation and edema. And it, it also acts as a dispersal agent. Like, you know, if you want the radius to be diluted, right? So my guess is that's what he was injecting your, uh, face with at the time when he was injecting stuff. Um, and so we use hyaluronic acid fillers, HA fillers for short. Um, because God forbid you had to, <laughs> you could dissolve them. And, and it's very rare to have an occlusion, but if you have an occlusion, you know, you need to know how to deal with it. And I think that's the second part of this is that it sounds like he recognized what it was, but didn't start treating it right away. And that's confusing. Like, why did he give you ice packs? That's the opposite of what would be, what would make sense. Um, so it sounds like he didn't have all the things he needed in his clinic to to treat an occlusion. And the other thing that that you in particular should have really had is something called hyperbaric oxygen treatment. And actually there's a newer one in researching this for today. There's a newer topical oxygen therapy, which I found out about. I don't know how to even get that um, or if that's something I could ever obtain in, in my clinic, but um from my understanding, you never mentioned that he offered that to you, but he said he did. The first time I heard about 
hyperbaric oxygen was in deposition uh, during my lawsuit when my lawyer asked him why he didn't uh, use that or administer it. And my doctor claimed that he offered it to me and I turned it down. Um, so uh, that was very shocking to hear. I, I, I was so confused about what was happening to me and I just did anything he said. If he said, this is what I needed to do, or this is what he's going to uh, administer, I just said, okay, and, you know, laid down and uh, let him do whatever he needed to do. But even when he diagnosed me, he left the room for a while before coming back and telling me that I had an occlusion. So I don't think he even knew what it was after examining me till he went and made a phone call to his wife. Um, he didn't have any answers for me until days or weeks later. And so much of this information, I didn't even find out until during the lawsuit um, yeah. or after I was already seeing a lot of other experts. So I didn't know about uh, radius being non-reversible. I didn't know about hyperbaric oxygen. I didn't know that I had necrosis and could possibly lose <laughs> a pieces of my face. So everything came as a surprise to me. And he seemed just as surprised by everything as it was happening. I just don't think he really knew a lot about uh, occlusions or how to treat them at all. Yeah. Well, it's very likely he hadn't ever had to treat one. So yeah, I, I, I hate to talk about this on the podcast because it freaks me out every time. So a filler occlusion is something that is the absolute, you know, biggest risk that we have in, in the medical spa or, you know, uh, aesthetic office. Uh, it should keep you up at night if you're an injector. And we actually have, you know, so standard is to have at least 12 vials of Hylinex in the fridge. Um, we actually have an ultrasound device to help guide treatment if this were to happen. And, um, we have, you know, we have aspirin, which will sort of help to stop clotting. Um, and we run little practice codes together, <laughs> me and my staff, uh, at least, at least once a year, just to review everything, make sure everybody knows all the up-to-date protocols. Um, I also have a relationship with two different oculoplastic surgeons. God forbid we needed them. Uh, and, and we've seen two, uh, one was a lady who had given herself an occlusion by, uh, she purchased a Hyaluron pen online that came with some chi Chinese filler and she gave herself an occlusion and, and we did treat that successfully. She was in our office for like three hours, but by the end of that, we had gotten her perfusion. She had lost perfusion to her nose as well. Um, but we got back, thank God. And then the second one, um, a person came in, she had filler at a dermatology office um, elsewhere in the city and came into my place the next day for something else completely unrelated. And my esthetician thought that her skin didn't look good. And she brought me in to take a look at that. And I got the ultrasound out and diagnosed the occlusion, but I gave her the option to go right back to the dermatologist. I thought the dermatologist would be... Um, hundred percent willing to just treat that right away, which she was. And, and, and as far as I know, that was treated successfully as well. That's why using an HA filler is so important that, you know, God forbid this were to happen to you, you can prevent, hopefully not always, but you can prevent the, this, um, ne tissue necrosis. And it happens to be that yours, your damage was ex extreme. I don't, I don't know that I've seen any cases quite this extensive in the literature or, you know, in any of the the meetings I've been to. Um, so I, I feel like at least the hyperbaric ox oxygen might have helped, but it might not have helped. It's impossible to know. So the, the, the take home messages I, for everybody at home, I, if you, if you have the desire, um, I would check out, um, Krista's TikTok and her Instagram. The, it, the article was recent in the UK daily mail. You can see examples of, of what the significance of what we're talking about. And I think it's really important for everybody to realize that using filler is not 
a, a nothing thing. It's a really big deal. And you need to, to go to somebody who's not only skilled at injection, injecting, but very um, wise in understanding how to treat these things um, and who has a relationship with, you know, the right um, connections to, to treat with hyperbaric oxygen if they don't have that. And even though this happened to be a board certified ENT, um, I originally, when I, when I first heard your story, I thought, well, this is really unusual because, because surgeons don't inject very much. Okay. That's not what they do. Surgeons do surgery. And usually, uh, surgeons, you know, delegate the injecting to someone who's not doing surgery, who's doing injecting all day. Um, and so most plastic surgeons, most DNTs, most dermatologists even will, will delegate that to a PA or a nurse practitioner or an RN, um, who's doing it all day, every day. I, I don't know about this guy. Um, I don't know if he was doing primarily injectables that there are some surgeons and, you know, some plastic surgeons and some ENTs who do a lot of their own injecting, but not that many. So, so I'm just kind of curious. I don't, I don't know. He is no longer in practice that we know of. So, um, thank so, yeah, <laughs> he, I, I, I don't, I don't honestly know. I did my best to find out what happened to him. Um, he, as far as I can tell, he is not actively practicing anywhere. Uh, and his wife, she's a practicing dermatologist here in, in Seattle. Um, and so it's not that he wasn't qualified but clearly he was using a filler that generally we wouldn't recommend. And he really wasn't prepared to treat his own complication. I think that that's really huge. And I, I think that for everybody at home, it's so, so important to find the right injector who doesn't just fill their Instagram with befores and afters and promise you glitzy glam, but who, uh, is doing this every day, who's, I, I, I dare say modest, who doesn't think that they're, oh, uh, you know, above this because, because an, a vascular occlusion can happen to anybody. Um, and if you think it can't happen to you, then you are just full of yourself because it could happen to absolutely anybody. That's why I, I freak out every time I talk about it because, you know, it's bound to happen sooner or later. And I just hope that, you know, my, my staff and, you know, me, myself, I hope that we practice enough that we're ready to, to deal with it. Um, if, and when that were to happen, but choosing a provider is just critical to find somebody who is qualified, know what they're doing. And I would say never, ever, ever get radius injected and never, ever, ever get Bellafil injected. It is simply not worth it. Even if the risk of having an occlusion is very low, it's, it's just not worth it because nothing in aesthetics is worth any kind of permanent harm. Um, and I think I told you this, um, Chris on the phone the other day, but there was a clinic it's closed now, but they were a big Bellafil injector. And I interviewed somebody who worked there and she said that about once a month, there was an occlusion at that clinic. And uh, I'm like, once a month with Bellafil, that that's a total disaster. I think that's, uh, unconscionable, right? If, you know, it just, it shouldn't be that way. And so I, I just, I hope everybody at home gets it. <laughs> this is like a really big deal. Um, and don't risk your face. Um, I would <laughs> like to say that, uh, at one point, uh, I did ask my doctor why, uh, this wasn't on the consent form and why he, we had never talked about it. Um, and he told me, that he felt it was more about skill than chance and just didn't think mm. that could happen to him. And uh, the last informed consent I ever signed was in 2016. It mm. was one paragraph. The only things listed on it were identical to the side effects of Botox, all of which I had experienced over 20 years of using Botox and knew that if I just waited it out and was patient, my face would always go back to normal. So I didn't 
Uh, I was never aware of um, any major complications. I thought injections were a really simple thing, kind of pre-med 101 that any (laughs) doctor could do and just had no idea that something catastrophic could even happen. So I thought the difference between Radius and Juvederm, for example, were only about the way it felt uh, under the skin. Uh, Juvederm went in softer and smoother and didn't last as long. And Radius felt more thick and crunchy sort of under the skin, but it lasted a lot longer and looked mm. the same. So I felt that Radius was the superior product, um, not realizing that it was non-reversible and these horrible things can happen. So it's so- also very important that you... Uh, that all of this is spelled out in the informed consent and also that you revisit this conversation and that informed consent at least once a year or anytime you're trying a new product. None of that happened with me. So I have no indication. That is absolutely true. And I, so very important to make sure. um, So for everybody who's listening, informed consent is a, you have to sign to have absolutely any medical procedure. And it's explaining the benefits, uh, risks, and alternatives to the procedure you're going to have. And it should be thorough. It should list every possible thing that could happen and that you understand <laughs> these are the risks. And yeah. I, I, you showed me that consent, and that was just the most minimal consent That's I've joke. ever seen. Yeah. And, and also in my, in my clinic, we go over that every single procedure. You you sign a brand new informed consent every time you have a procedure. And I we also have this very long list of complications for filler because it's really complicated. And I would say anytime, if you're interested in having filler and the person who is about to inject you does not mention vascular occlusion as a possible risk, then I would not have this done because they're not being forthright with you and they are not being thorough. I can't tell you how many times, this is actually uh, in my book, how many times somebody has come to me, they've had filler many times elsewhere. And I am the first person to ever mention vascular occlusion to them. Unbelievable. I just am dumbfounded by that. So it, it is, it should be absolutely part of the informed consent and anybody having this should realize it's kind it's really a big deal. It's a bigger deal than pretty much anything else we do in the spa because everything else is reversible. As you said, Botox, if you don't like it, it's going to wear off. Laser, right. it, the worst that can happen is you could get a burn, but burns heal. Very rarely is there any kind of long-term scarring from from a laser burn, thank goodness. Um, but this this is a really, really big deal with very, you know, very large possible negative consequences. So... Um, And I can tell you, it feels a lot worse than it looks. I mean, without my prosthetics and makeup and everything on, I look pretty creepy and pretty weird, but my looks are still the least of my problems now. So uh, has it affected your singing voice? And it has uh, uh, because I have the shriveled, uh, you know, left nasal passage um, and breath support and control issues. You know, the, the air doesn't go in and out of my nose as quickly and at the same capacity as it did before. So this does have effects on my breath control and my tone. And I'm, I'm still, I still have skills and I'm still good at my job and I'm still doing it, but I'm definitely not a hundred percent and I never will be again. So, you know, I'm learning to sew. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's it's a problem. And the prosthetics have their own sets of um, pros and cons and issues that come along with them regarding fit and adhesive and sweat Mm -hmm. when my body is active. So, you know, I can't perform as much with full bands where I'm dancing and, um, you know, doing choreographed routines and things like that anymore. Um, I've kind of simmered it down to mostly jazz and acoustic acts and then an occasional, uh, full band show where I have a slew of, of problems, uh, you know, that I, that I have to get through, but I can, I can still get the job done. It's just, um, 
it's a lot harder and it's not the joyful uh fun experience that it once was it's it's just my job so it's it has it has pretty negatively impacted your not just your personal life and social life but your professional life as well oh yeah Every, I, I would like all to, aspects um, of my life are, are adversely affected from this horrible <laughs> um, incident. Yeah, I, horrible. I just I want to mention one more thing for our listeners. Um, we're kind of getting, we're kind of going long on time here. I just want to let people know what happened. And if it's okay with you, I'm just going to let them know what happened with the malpractice lawsuit. Sure. Okay. So, um, as you can imagine, this was a lawsuit, as you've already heard there, there was a deposition and, and, um, the doctor chose not to settle. And, um, and in the end, um, Krista lost this case. So she does not have a a pile of money to pay for this giant surgery if she ever wanted to undergo that, which sounds very risky and it may not end up fixing it, um, does not have the pile of money to fly to the Midwest to get the prosthetics. It's, it's really a drag. And I, I, there are, there are a lot of hurdles to a successful malpractice case. And, and I, I looked at the details of this and I thought, well, this is a really, it's a very, very difficult thing because, you know, there are four components to a malpractice suit. So first is a duty to the patient, which is established anytime you have a doctor patient relationship, which is clear here. So he had a duty. Um, and then there's dereliction of that duty, a violation in the standard of care. And I, I will say there's, it's, close. That's the hardest thing. He, he used radius. I wouldn't use radius, but there are plenty of people who do use radius out there. Um, I think he was underprepared to treat a complication, uh, but he did treat it. Um, if he had treated it maybe a little better, a little faster, would it have helped? Maybe, but it, there's no, there's no proof of that either. Um, so that part was really, was, was probably the most challenging part of the case. And then Then there's two more components of a malpractice case. One is, you know, did the dereliction of duty, the violation of standard of care, did that cause harm? It absolutely did. Okay. And clearly there were damages, right? So those four components, it's just that one proving that, proving that he did something wrong or just not good enough. That is the hardest thing. And in the end, um, there is no, nothing that really made you whole and, and that's what upsets me the most about this. And that's why I think it's really important for everybody to know this when they pick a provider, because I know I've mentioned in the past, you know, if you go to somebody who doesn't have malpractice, there's, there's not even, first of all, you can't sue someone for malpractice if they're not a doctor. So like if, if they don't have a license or they're an RN working under a doctor, I guess you can ensue the, the medical director, but um, as we'll see, I have another um, podcast coming up where I'm going to interview someone who is in a very similar space to you. But the person who did that to her was an unlicensed uh, provider who had no insurance and didn't care at all about her. Had no idea what she was doing. So, Krista, I just want to thank know which you. Is worse. <laughs> <laughs> I no. honestly, it's. It's all bad, and I. That's why I'm hoping that these conversations uh, shine a light on the industry and make people realize that it's not just like getting a haircut, getting your lips filled, or other you know aesthetic treatments is not a nothing, and it's not okay that people are practicing medicine um, either unprepared or not not knowing what they're doing or even just having no license at all or operating illegally or doing stuff and not being able to treat their own complications. It's all, you know, a really big problem because the industry is, it's, there are plenty of laws, but there is no regulation and no enforcement. And so it's just the wild west out there. So Krista, thank you so much for being with me today. And Uh, You all at home can check out the links that we have in the show notes um, to be able to see Krista's story, see some pictures and connect with her if you want to. Thank you so much, Krista. Thank you very much, Dr. D. If you have a question or a crazy story of your own that you'd like to hear on MedSpa Mayhem, contact us through our website, medspamayhem.com, or check out our contact info in the show notes. 
If you learned something and like what we're doing, please tell your friends and give us a five-star rating in your podcast app. And read the book. Med Spa Mayhem is coming out on June 11th, 2024. Pre-order now on Amazon. You can find the link to pre-order and a link to our website in the show notes. Thanks for listening. I hope that sharing Krista's experience has been eye-opening. Vascular occlusion isn't for the faint of heart. I hope understanding what it is, how to treat it, and what the possible risks are will help you make a more informed decision about dermal fillers. This has been Med Spa Mayhem with Dr. Kate D. We are so grateful you're listening, and we hope you've learned at least one fun or possibly disturbing fact today. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review. Oh, and read the book. Med Spa Mayhem comes out June 11th, 2024, available everywhere books are sold. You can pre-order now on Amazon. Links and more can be found in the show notes and on medspamayhem.com.